Hello. Uh, we are here on a, for me at least, it's a late Saturday morning uh, with the Ludiverse Lab, which uh, involves bringing uh, educator types together in order to uh, play a game or, and be kind of introduced to different types of role-playing games and then to kind of give some thought as to what kind of uh, usefulness uh, these games might afford us as teachers or educators of various types. Uh, we are, uh, this is, I'm very excited because I, I had this idea of putting together a series of summer games that would involve uh, fantasy role-playing games of different types, but uh, games or kind of scenarios that would be kind of pushing these kinds of games into territory that perhaps we don't necessarily necessarily kind of think of like this is where the game is designed to go so fantasy role-playing games i think a lot of us think oh the dungeon delve that is the kind of uh kind of default setting of them and uh, i was kind of intentionally trying to kind of think of of ways of kind of breaking a little bit out of that mold and i'm very uh excited that uh we have Richard with us today to kind of uh, show us uh, something new, I think, and kind of eye-opening as to the, the type of thing that could be done with this type of game. Um, but I'm going to start with the players, and uh, I'm, I'm myself am a, a player today, so I'll start with myself and then I'll just kind of work around uh, my screen. Uh, my name is Robbie Borth. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a high school English teacher. Uh, living in the Central Florida, Orlando area. And uh, I've been playing games for, for a long time. Uh, fantasy role-playing games goes all the way back to, to my middle school years. But I'm, I'm kind of always uh, kind of interested in, in this uh, particular genre of, of game and uh, especially excited but with uh, over the past few years, it seems that this kind of game has kind of uh, taken some interesting new directions. Um, and uh, why don't I go next to Lara, if you'll just say a little few words of introduction. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Lara, uh, daughter of uh, Robbie over there. Um, yeah, I am, a, a, I guess now a sophomore in college. Uh, I've been playing role-playing games for a while now, but uh, <laughs> yes, very exciting. Um, so yeah, but excited to play, excited to be here. And uh, Aaron, I'll go to you next. Hello, I'm Aaron DeRosa, uh, he, him. I'm a professor of American literature in Southern California, and I've been playing uh, role-playing games for three years now. And that's my story. Okay. And uh, Ryan? Uh, I'm Ryan Windekinet, uh, he, him pronouns. Uh, I am a senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And uh, so I've been playing role playing games since the early 90s, off and on. Um, I'm super excited to play Barrow Keep, uh, backed it on Kickstarter, first time playing. Uh, and I'm also, this is my second time in the Ludo, Ludoverse Labs. Um, uh, but also, I, I'm excited to play with Richard again because I uh, haven't played a game with Richard since I think it was the Caverns of Thracia uh, Beyond the Wall game. So looking forward to more of that. Awesome. Yeah, that was about two years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a little while ago. Yeah. Okay. And Richard? If you yeah, wanna... I, I'm Richard Ryan. Yeah. I am the creator of Barrow Keep, which is a, a game uh, inspired by series fiction of the, the 90s and aughts. Uh, using sort of a D&D style framework. Um, and uh, by day, I am a, an instructional design for e-learning consultant uh, working with colleges and universities. Um, and uh, I guess that's me, so. Okay. All right. And uh, yeah, Richard, if you just want to continue kind of taking us through, we've already spent a, a few minutes uh, uh, well, pr prior to meeting today, we we had kind of looked at the playbooks and we've done a little bit of preliminary work, but I think we'll probably be diving some more into finishing up character creation and getting a little understanding of the setting that we're dealing with today. Awesome. So uh, I want to just kind of work right on across kind of our character 
uh, keeping booklet. Uh, I do want to point out for you guys that uh, there is a lines and veils sheet that is already kind of filled out. I think all of you understand lines and veils um, for audience at home. It's really just a, a sense of what would work well uh, in the game uh, and uh, what would what should be what should kind of be off screen or what should not come up in the game's content at all. Uh, I like to put them in the character keeper because it allows you guys to fill them in anonymously, and I, I can even ask questions, and you can you can add notes anonymously uh, without having to necessarily uh, feel like you have to uh, you know speak up and be identified uh, out loud uh, or on air. So if you would like to add a line or a veil, lines are things that should not be in the game at all. Veils are things that are fine to be there, but we're gonna not spend a lot of time dwelling on them. Visually, we'll probably fade to black or shift around and talk about something else. Uh, but uh, they're just, they're slightly distinct from lines, and we just like we don't we don't want this in the game at all. Um, for instance, lines currently that I've put in are violence against children, um, sexual coercion, assault, suicide, uh, and then veils that we've put in are sexual content and intimacy. Uh, or any sort of or uh, any sort of uh, torture. Uh, I'd like to start with Lucy, played by Ryan. Ryan, what do you know about Lucy so far, based on what you've generated from the playbook? So so far, I know that Lucy is an imp, uh, a lost familiar that was uh, called forth by a sorcerer uh, a century ago. Mm -hmm. um, but since forgotten, kind of like who that was, and now I've been lost. And I kind of just been hanging around Barrow Keep since then. Um, made friends with my my fellow PCs here, but uh, and just just kind of hanging out, looking not to be banished back to where I was called forth from. Um, and uh, apparently, I have uh, some magical powers, so. Um, I am a clever illusionist, so I've got the spell of ventriloquism. Um, I kind of like to hang out specifically uh, kind of in the unused tombs and crypts. Um, perhaps there I, I've maybe met um, Nomen. I don't know, I guess we'll find out. And while doing that, I've learned the spell Animate Dead. And I also hang out with an Arcaneer, which I guess Lucy knows what that is, but I do not. Uh, I should note that uh, Bear Keep through a, a weird and 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 uh, set of of initially accidents has has landed in sort of a steampunkish setting, uh, kind of an, a magical steampunkish setting. Uh, it is it is steampunk with the dials turned back to like seven or eight instead of like. 13 or 14 where they normally are uh well past 11 uh so uh it is uh, it is definitely an old castle in a in a emerging uh in a setting of emerging technology so it is a it is an old location um so but uh sky ships trains those are all things that happen in the world and uh you know an arcaneer uh, i'm gonna shift over and ask robbie about uh his character anam all right, so Anam is a hostage. Uh, the basic story is that my family uh, once fought a shadow war with Barrow Keep. Barrow Keep won. Uh, almost a year ago, the Archon of Barrow Keep asked my family to sit, stand, send a hostage to ensure my family's good behavior. And it was my good fortune to be selected as the, the hostage that would come and live in Barrow Keep. Um, my aunt, uh, who was superstitious of my strange powers and also annoyed by my late mother's loyalist, sent me over. So she's the one who pulled the strings to get me over here. Um, I, I am given many liberties in, in Barrow Keep. Uh, but uh, I can only contact my my aunt via her emissary. So I am a hostage, but it's not like I'm I'm kind of uh, put away in the dungeon. I have actually a nice room 
uh, near the, the Archon's family, and I'm allowed to kind of wander around uh, the keep. I am, uh, in terms of my archetype, I am a beast bound, uh, which gives me certain abilities. I, I have a, a beast companion who momentarily will be defined, and I have some ability to communicate with uh, both my companion as well as with uh, other animals. Um, I am uh, clever uh, in terms of uh, some of the other aspects of character creation. I'm clever. I always have a response, even when silence would be the better choice. Uh, in terms of my my own family that I left, uh, it was known for its its uh, forests. Uh, has a kind of these low mountains and these vast forests that characterize the land that I uh, come from. And uh, I do have uh, one of my questions was someone in the keep lost a loved one to my uh, family's shadow war. Who and why do you want this person's good opinion? That turns out to be the Archon's cousin, uh, who I have given the name Aegea. Uh, and uh, so that's the cousin who uh, is uh, especially unhappy with me because of my family connection and that uh, Aegea lost someone dear to her. And uh, so she has been uh, spreading rumors about Keith. Uh, Lara, could you tell us a little about Noman? Yeah, so I'm playing Noman, who is the Revenant. Um, so his story is, almost a century ago, I was a squire to a now forgotten heir who was assassinated. I saw something terrible about that crime, but I can't remember clearly. Uh, I know I was killed to keep that secret. Uh, my body was hidden and forgotten, uh, but something has brought me back. However, I'm no longer truly alive. Um, in the hours of daylight, I cannot be in mortal form and must move about in the form of a small animal. Um, and for Noman, I think that animal changes depending on his mood. Um, he's, he's very sad. He's big sad. Uh, he's, he's forgotten by most of the people in the, uh, in the keep. Um, but sometimes people will hear a sigh from in, in the corner of the halls or something. And they'll turn and they'll think that they see like maybe a wisp of, of no men, but they, they, they never, they, they kind of brush it aside. Um, so my, uh, my archetype is the Revenant, um, and I am an inquisitive undead. So my powers are undead, undying, um, involuntary shape shifting, and turn the living. Um, so that'll be exciting. So even though I'm kind of quiet, I'm very stubborn. Uh, so I will be very insistent. Uh, I will just kind of show up. I might not say anything, but I'll be there imposing my uh, presence on people. Um, I am a chronicler, like the archivist I knew in life. I see small details that others will miss. Um, and then what curse did the murder of uh, you and your knight bring on to the keep? So on the 100th anniversary of the murder, death shall stalk the halls of the keep, taking those that don't expect it and leaving those awaiting it unprotected. And last but not least, Esh, played by Aaron. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, Esh, uh, she, her, is the ward, and the ward is an orphan. You'd gotten a lodging and work when the future consort of Barrow Keep passed through town. They appreciated how you seemed to anticipate their every need, and when the visions of fire and destruction seized you, they were the ones who took you seriously. Their guards drove the raiders away, and the strange aristocratic traveler took you as their ward. You came to Barrow Keep when they did. Um, I am dutiful to my consort, the future consort, uh, then future consort, might still be future consort. Um, uh, yeah, I'm dutiful to I'm them. I Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean, go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, I am energetic. Uh, my archetype is a seer. Uh, so there's a sense of like, uh, vision similar to the Revenant, but instead of seeing things that most people don't see, I just read them in a different way, I think. Uh, I think that that'll be an interesting um, play there. I have very searching eyes. Uh, that's my jam. 
And what else do I know of myself? Uh, I was clever and now I am no more. Now I am instead naive. The older you got, the less amusing the court found your star-eyed aspirations. When I worked at the village inn, I was closest to the wandering apothecaries. Uh, when the village needed someone to set their bones, clean wounds, compound herbs, they looked to uh, your wandering friend. Uh, your wandering friend looked to you for help. A wandering friend I have not named. And what did what did you demonstrate an odd talent for? And what ally did it earn you? Is this an unlikely friend, discreet paramour, or unofficial men mentor? Uh, and that's in the uh, talent of observation. Name one of the Justicar's young cousins who saw you who you saw sneaking away from the forbidden section of the Keep's library. And what did the secret passage you followed them through lead? Uh, Senen is the name of the said cousin. Uh, and they are uh, taking up quarters with a with a lover uh, of a usurper of some sort. So we're going to pause in character creation real quick because I think it's important to get a sense of three big NPCs that have shown up in all your playbooks. Uh, Normally, we take a little more time to generate this so that uh, we can make sure that we have uh, time to kind of start today before we kind of move into next week where we'll... Uh, uh, finish up. Um, and thanks, Robbie, for the time to do a two-parter. Um, we're going to generate the, I've, I've already kind of pre-generated some information about the three big NPCs. Uh, in all games of Barrow Keep, and just for the audience, this is just out of Kickstarter. It's still in playtest. So uh, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll give Robbie information about how to uh, how to kind of hook up with the playtest. Um, and uh, it's also I should I should mention we're playing today with the rules for sharp swords and sinister spells, which is my friend Diogo's uh, game. And uh, if you get to the playtest page, there will be a link to picking up the rules for sharp swords and sinister spells. Uh, but first, uh, there is there is the Archon of Barrow Keep. Archon is uh, sort of the title of sort of district rulers, um, and uh, the Archon of Barrow Keep has been in the district for exactly 10 years and has no relation by blood or marriage to anyone who came before. So people still refer to this Archon has been there for 10 years as the new Archon. Um, uh, and, that, and that's in all games of Bureau Keep for this particular Archon. I determined that this is a scion of distant, of distant aristocrats. So this is someone from a distant aristocratic family. Uh, she, her pronouns who is unpopular with the local oligarchs for sort of being uh, politically imported uh, and not having a relationship to the district before that. Uh, and I'm gonna ask you guys to choose a name for the Archon. Again, the pronouns are she, her. I like the Mela name. We'll go with Mela. All right. Uh, the Ward playbook uh, played by Aaron uh, specifically mentions a relationship to uh, the consort as being taken in by an aristocrat who becomes the consort of Barrow Keep. Uh, I refer to them as the newly crowned consort. They have been in the position for a year. Uh, the Archon had been widowed uh, for some time before that. Uh, and the uh, the consort was recently uh, crowned. Uh, the consort is also a distant archon's daughter, she, pronoun she her, affectionate or doting on the whole the rest of the archon's household, uh, but having only been in place for a year. Uh, I'm going to put some names into our chat. Or so the new consort is Ilya. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, the final one is the heir apparent. Um, it's a person who may or may not be related to the archon or the consort, but has sort of been appointed as part of the uh, the, the new archon taking over uh, as the heir apparent. Uh, Dyrell uh, indicated this is this is a person who is ambitious, assertive, great, but gracious, who has plans to dominate the whole region, even beyond the Barrow Keep district. Their pronouns are they, them. I'm going to put. Uh, 
six more names down there. Feel free to pick some other ones if you uh, prefer. So, Laura, why don't you take this one? Give us a name here. Albina seems like a pretty powerful name. That seems right. I think with that, I'd like to go back in to our last couple of questions. I want to do these like one by one, if that's okay with you. And we will start with, with Esh. Uh, Aaron, what is your, uh, what's your answer for that? What, what is your fourth question and what is your kind of, what, what answer did you generate for it? Uh, where in the keep have you gone where you've needed to be alone? I'm going to say a forgotten shrine in the catacombs to an ancient nameless king. The statue is so ancient, the face has worn away. Nice. Okay. So there's a lot of going down to the catacombs. Which is awesome. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Noman, Laura, what is your fourth question there for Noman? Yeah, so my fourth question is, at night, when others sleep, you sometimes go to the catacombs. Tell us about the spirit who has become your ally there. So I, my, my spirit friend is the ghost of the old knight's lover who has tried to lead me into the catacomb several times each time going deeper but each time he becomes lo lost and forlorn before reaching a clear destination do you remember a name or just the fact that they're they're your old knight's lover um i don't think i remember a distinct name i think i remember letters though okay. um, and like they come and go but i think i think that the the name begins with an s nice and um what's that fourth question for you uh it says, uh, you have been close with animals, which my aunt found disturbing. She tried to separate me from my beast companion, but it followed me to Barrow Keep anyway. Uh, I again just went with a, a random role and appropriately uh, came up with, because uh, I'm a kind of brooding melancholy type, I came up with the raven. Uh, I awoke from a nightmare one morning to find my old companion tapping at my window. Beautiful. And Lucy. So my fourth question reads, in addition to your spellcraft, what innate abilities do you have? Um, I had been doing roles up to this point, but uh, I wasn't as clever as Lucy, apparently. I wasn't clever enough to realize that I would be, you know, given the option of what my, my ability was. And I've just been imagining Lucy since the beginning as having wings. Uh, it kind of fits some of the stuff that's already happened at this point. So rather than rolling, I'm just going to go with a uh, flight. Perfect. When you extend your bat-like wings, you can fly twice as fast as you walk. Uh, you know the spell Supernatural Reflex. Nice. Okay. And then we're going to snake back around with uh, Lucy. Esh is on, or sorry, Anam is on your right. Anam Noman is on your right. Esh, Lucy is on your right for this last question. And this last question will give both you a bonus and give your person on your right a bonus. Uh, and we can answer them briefly first and then sort of backtrack and talk about this, the stories they uh, imply uh, or suggest. Uh, but let's start with you, Lucy. Uh, what's that last question for you and, and what came up on your uh, decision or role? Recently, the friend on your right helped you stay hidden from someone who is definitely hunting for you. Who was it? Why do you suspect they're still watching? 
Um, and I have not yet rolled, so I'll just go ahead and do that now. I rolled a four, so a four reads. <laughs> this actually fits kind of, anyway. Well, um, drunk one night, a squire spotted you with your friends and panicked about demons in the keep. Your friend pushed him back while you hid. Uh, so my friend uh, Anam gains plus one physique. And I gain plus one agility. Robbie, is, is Anam a, a drinker? <laughs> um, I, I think Anam... Uh, is uh, a drinker but has very uh expensive tastes i see so, so as long as it's like some kind of uh refined wine or cognac or something like that yeah so I, I i've been ripping off matt Groening's disenchanted for my character um and lucy in the show is certainly a drinker so uh, perhaps we were we were both in the the bar when this encounter happened. Okay, and again, just repeat that again. So so somebody saw you. Somebody yes, from out drunk one night, a spot a squire spotted you with your friends and panicked about demons in the keep. Okay, your right. friend pushed him back while you hid. So I kind of imagine that Lucy likes to kind of skulk around places. One of those places being wherever the, the local watering hole is, um, you know, maybe snatching drinks when no one's looking or uh, taking the, the bottoms of mugs that people leave behind, things like that. And uh, maybe this happened one of those nights. I think, Robbie, the first time you played Barakeep, we had an informal bar that the, uh, the castle attendants and servants had sort of set up behind the kitchen. Yes. Yeah, and in that one, I, I was I was playing like one of the the servants in the in the keep, right? That I. Yeah. All right, uh, Anam, what is your final question? And uh, Noman is the person to your right. All right. So um, my question was, uh, you and. Uh, it's Noman, right? Uh, me and Noman uh, discovered uh, assassination attempts against the heir of Barrow Keep. What happened? What evidence do I see of my aunt's involvement? Um, so uh, I, I, I rolled for this one and came up with the false pilgrims. You found uh, the pilgrims beneficiaries of the Archon's hospitality sneaking into the heir's rooms with a broken plasmic core ready to explode. What did you and your friend do? And this is going to result in Anam gaining one willpower and I will gain one agility. Um, so Noman's willpower goes up by one and your agility goes up by one, correct? Right, correct. Okay. Um, and, and I guess um, it, it, what, what makes sense to me if we want to fill in some more details, since it was my agility, I, I imagine that, that uh, Noman did the job of, of frightening uh, the, the attempt uh, and kind of managing to, to foul up uh, the the sneaking that the that the the false pilgrims were doing and and when that distraction was in play, uh, I nimbly uh, kind of was able to to get the core and and perhaps threw it into the moat out the window. Nice. All right, Nimmin, does that sound good to you? All right. 
And then Numen, Esh is on your right. What is that fast last question for you? All right. So when the heir apparent went missing, where did you and your friend find them? What mysterious thing did they do or say that they claim to be unable to remember? So, and I rolled and it says, sitting quietly in the room, despite the festival in the great hall below, they called you by a name only your former knight, the old heir used. Your friend gains plus one physique. Okay. And what do you gain out of that, too? Oh, I get one willpower. Nice, okay. So, yeah. Um, I think that the name that they... So, they called me by a name. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe I had some kind of pet name that um, the old heir used to, used to call me. Um... I don't remember what that is right now, but I'm sure that it will come to me if momentarily. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Yes, does that sound about right to you? Any details sure. or questions, Jeff? All right. Uh, Esh, Lucy is to your right. Aaron, what did you get for that final question? While wandering the keep one night uh, after everyone else was asleep, Lucy and I discovered a mystery about the Archon. Why have you kept it between yourselves so far? And I came up with, uh, you saw someone who looked oddly familiar escorted out of the keep by the Archon late one night. It was only later that you remembered the face from the raid that tried to burn your village and strike down the future consort. And uh, Lucy gets plus one willpower. I get plus one intellect. I mean, what I normally do here is kind of take everything you guys have given me. Uh, and one thing... I will ask is if you guys can fill in where it says allies and rivals, fill in any names that came up uh, or at least short descriptors that came up. If you'd like me to fill in a name for you. And then uh, I take about a 15 minute break and uh, do sort of what I call the scenario pack. And both the, for this kind of game, both the term playbook and scenario pack were created by on the, I'm with educators so I should tell you that uh, my, my sources are, um, yeah, I, I, the, the playbook and scenario pack structure were created by uh, Flatline Games for Beyond the Wall, uh, which is also a, a, a YA fiction inspired RPG, very much focusing on, on a series fiction like Susan Cooper, Lloyd Alexander. Uh, and I've, I've, I've sort of been more inspired for this particular game by uh, George R. R. Martin, uh, Robin Hobb, uh, Mercedes Lackey, and a few other kind of later later figures. But uh, Beyond the Wall is definitely sort of what got us started in looking in this direction. So, um, but uh, we didn't really take about a 15 minute break. I do the scenario pack uh, using names and details that you guys have given me. Um, and then we come back and begin. Welcome back. I think we're going to pick up the action at uh, a few hours before a large dinner. Uh, but uh, so the uh, the dinner is to receive a group of pilgrims who have sort of already entered the gates and are setting up uh, a mix of uh, tents and temporary buildings and uh, you know space in a. Uh, in uh, one of the side buildings of the keep um, for themselves. Um, and they're going to be officially welcomed by the Archon. Uh, now there's already some fraught history with pilgrims. Uh, so, uh, but this, this uh, they have actually, uh, they have a relic with them that they're escorting and they have a well-regarded uh they're they're taking the the relic from from a one 
religious site to another religious site. Uh, there are stories that the relic they have was initially uh, discovered near Barrow Keep or, uh, or, or from an area near Barrow Keep, so it was appropriate that they uh, make a stop at Barrow Keep uh, on their way. Um, and it was also convenient since it was inland from Barrow Keep and they are essentially the next stage of their pilgrimage is all getting aboard the train uh, down the hill at Barrow Town uh, for the uh, the comfortable last portion of their pilgrimage uh, or a comfortable next portion of their pilgrimage. Um, that's what's coming. Let's flash back though and figure out a few brief things that happened to you guys the night before. Uh, just as the pilgrims were beginning to arrive in the keep uh, uh, late at night um, and overdue. Um, and let's start with with Esh. Uh, Ish, do you, are you the type of person who sleeps easily, or does it take you a while to to drift off? Um, I think I sleep easily, but I'm easily awoken. Um, so you can tell me, uh, kind of once we're finished, whether this thing woke you up or just sort of sent you deeper into a uh, sleep. Uh, last night, a figure on a black mount. Uh, road through your dreams. Um, why don't you check intelligence, Esh? Or, no, sorry, intellect. Check intellect. And you do that by just rolling a d20 and seeing if you get equal to or under your number. Uh, I got an 11, and you said intellect is 15 for me, so I'm under. Okay. Um, Ish, it's the it's the kind of thing where like in dreams it's way more important to think fast than to actually be fast you know you don't actually you, your body responds strangely to exactly what you want it to do almost like you're dreaming lucidly um, and uh, despite the fact that the writer is mounted you are able to just sort of think yourself into keeping pace with the writer and staying unseen um, And you find yourself in a graveyard. Uh, the The writer leaves the road near the keep. You weren't even sure you were in the keep when you started the dream, but the writer leaves the road very near the keep and rides off into the woods. Uh, he passes an, an abandoned village in the woods that you are you are have been to. You've seen that. Uh, abandoned village um, and goes for some time along paths you've never paid attention to or perhaps not even seen. Uh, just very, very thin paths. Some of them are, are probably just places the, the earth coincidentally kind of wore away during erosion or from tree limbs. Um, and you find yourself surrounded by what look like tombstones. But they're really almost more just sort of dark and monolithic. Uh, there's a dark stone you've not seen from the area before. Uh, it seems to have something written on it, but every time you try to look at what's written on it, you can't read it and you're not sure why um, you're not especially sure especially not sure why because in your dream there are there is no light the the sky is completely overcast and you're not sure how you're seeing as much as you're seeing in the dream uh and there's someone that the writer has come to see 
amidst these amidst these sort of things that seem like tombstones. In fact, in your dream, I think you kind of are completely aware that they're tombstones in the way that sometimes in dreams you know things that you're not sure how you how you figure that out. Um, and that's when you wake up. Uh, so this is what happened to you the night before. Um, did that sort of like send you deeper asleep or, or wake you up for the rest of the evening, wake you up for a little bit? Um, I think that wakes me up. And one of the things that I do is I go to the, um, where is it? There's a forgotten shrine in the catacombs of a nameless king with no face. And I think the sort of inability to read these uh, monolith slash tombstones, I think that that sends me to this face that I can't read. So I think I'm just wandering halls. Is this blank face, when you look at it, does it seem like stone that was worn away? Or does it seem like somebody constructed this to have sort of an abstract facelessness? Um, I think it, it's either... I think it's worn away because I think I still see in moments of lucidity, like shape to it. Like I can almost see the the nose protruding again and the, the sunken eyes and that kind of thing. Um, but never enough to actually like, you know, do that facial recognition thing. Right. Gotcha, gotcha. Let's scroll up and talk a little bit about but Anam, what happened to you last night? Anam, last night, just before dawn, all the hounds in the kennels began to bay and snap. Um, why don't you check willpower? And that's a uh, roll a d20 and get equal to or under. I rolled a nine, which is uh, underneath my 13. Nice. All right. Uh, as you kind of come awake and look out the, uh, the window of your apartment, which faces the kennel, uh, you see a strange form of a person, not like anybody you know, uh, fleeing from the sound of the hounds barking. Now, you know, the hounds are in the kennel. They're not just kind of roaming the castle yards freely. Uh, you could swear that in the clear, full moonlit night, uh, you saw a glint off somebody's teeth, which is something you hear about in stories, but never actually see because people's teeth just aren't that big. In fact, animals' teeth aren't usually that, that that big, but it looks almost like the mouth of a cat, like where every tooth is pointed. Um, and then the hounds quiet down. A few of the, the, the kennel hands come and get the dogs to quiet down. Um, and... Uh, There's no sign that anything was taken. Uh, or uh, no, there's no there's no sense of alarm other than getting the hounds to quiet down. Um, Noman. Just before sunrise this morning, you saw someone, and, and, and you know, sunrise is where a lot of people are getting up to get things ready for the day. And there's a lot of, you know, business at the gates. Lots of people come and make deliveries. Uh, uh, and you saw something. Uh, Would you check your intellect score? You just grab a d20, roll it, and see if you get equal to or under. Sure 
right. So I did not get under my intellect. I rolled a 14. So, Noman, the first time you hear about strangers coming and going from the keep under suspicious circumstances, you can ask me to tell you, tell you what you saw. Uh, but for some reason, it just didn't stick in your mind. Uh, you feel like something important happened that morning, but uh, what did you get? What do you think you got distracted by? Um, yeah, so I think that um, I think that maybe whatever I saw triggered like some kind of memory of my killing, and uh, so I think that that uh, <laughs> that was pretty uh, distracting. Was it a? Uh... Do you think it was the face of somebody or do you think it was just sort of one of those weird coincidental things? Like, uh, you remember the morning before the murder, you, uh, you know, you had eggs and you see people bringing eggs in or something like that. Is it, or is it something that you definitely saw somebody's face or yeah, so somebody's face? So I think that it wasn't so much that I saw it so much as I smelled something and I can't place the smell because ghosts do not smell, which is why it was very odd that I smelled something, but that like brought me back and I was, and it's just very. A pleasant smell? Or a, a smell that would be pleasant if, if it were not associated with something terrible. Yeah, no, I think that, um, it was a kind of sweet smell, um, but then, like, as I, I kind of processed it, it became sickeningly sweet. And then it began, it be, became intermingled with an almost metallic-y smell. That's, all right. Lucy. Um, something, you spend a lot of time around the keep at night, Lucy. Uh, it's nice not having to sleep or, but sometimes boring. Um, so you notice a lot of things that if the keep had more nightlife, you might not notice. Um, and uh, there's something like a star that has been hovering over the eastern tower for several day for several nights. Um, it seems to be in the same place, which even over the course of a night. If it were a star, it would move. It wouldn't seem so utterly stationary. Um, would you make an intellect check for me? And again, that's a d20 equal to or under. Critical success. Rolled a one. Nice. All right. So one one cool thing in this system is your critical success is actually nailing your number exactly. So if your if your intellect is a fourteen, and you nail that number, uh, and I'll talk to you about why that is in a bit because we're gonna we're gonna talk about things that have difficulties uh, eventually. But uh, if you nail that number right out of the gate, that is that is your that is your best possible result is to get right on the number for you. Uh, and sometimes you'll be able to sort of manipulate the dice so that uh, uh, you can get closer to that number uh, by either knocking them up or down. Um, but one is definitely a lovely success. Uh, and uh, I think it's just last night. You've seen this for a few nights now, but just last night you realized why it was bothering you especially because you realize it's not it's not a star um it is um 
you know, the sorcerers might summon imps from the underworld to serve as their familiars. Uh, they summon something called an eye from the underworld to serve as their eyes. Uh, and it's essentially a, a glowing eye that someone is using to spy on the keep uh, from a strange vantage point. Um, so that uh, as you get closer to the evening, um, and I'd say you're a couple of hours away from dinner, it's getting late enough in spring now that uh, you are pretty close to sunset right about dinner time or right about uh, evening time. Um, and uh, I want to know what the four of you have been doing with all the recent goings on. Uh, including ones that came up in your playbook and came up just now, as you uh, settle into to or rendezvous with each other, what have you been doing today to think about, talk about, address suspicious activity going on? Uh, and I'll let you guys volunteer to go first and kind of work, work from there. Uh, or I can or I can pick somebody, but that seems mean. I, I can tell you that um, given that these are uh, pilgrims who have arrived, uh, Anam probably uh, would be uh, asking about uh, these pilgrims. Uh, there was that previous episode where we had pilgrims in the, uh, in the keep who turned out not to be exactly what they were. And so I, I probably would be just asking questions uh, about this group. And uh, it's not like my aunt to uh, try the same tactics twice. So there's part of me that says, oh, she, she wouldn't kind of do the, the, the false pilgrim trick again. But just to be sure, I probably would be getting some information about that. And I guess the other thing Anam would do is uh, he would probably pay a visit to the kennel and uh, using that uh, ability to speak to animals uh, would probably be inquiring of the dogs. Since they have a keen sense of smell, I think I especially would, would be asking about unusual smells uh, from the evening before uh, that maybe got them all worked up. Like why, why were they kind of all kind of antsy like that? Would you go ahead and make an intellect check there, Anam? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I'll tell you a couple of things you can find out about the pilgrims, unless you're going to get really sort of outspoken about it, if you're being subtle. Yeah, I rolled a, I rolled a four, uh, which is under underneath my intellect. Uh, the dogs are definitely, they, they smelled something a few of them describe like cats. Uh, or you get the impression they smelled a cat. Uh, but others say something like they smelled something from deep in the woods. Um, and lurking. Uh, and they said something about two. There were two. Okay. Um. And asking about the pilgrims, you definitely uh, find out they are, uh, they definitely have a, a strong kind of pedigree. So some of them are from down the coast in the neighboring district. Uh, they tend to well, they, they tend to mostly be from, from wealthy mercantile or uh, trader families. Um, And they are donating a relic uh, that has been in their local temple to the temple in uh, the capital. And they are essentially escorting the relic. Uh, they kind of came by ship to Baratown Harbor uh, rather than, you know, stay in, stay in rooms like poor people or stay in an inn like poor people. They are staying with a local noble. Um, 
which is also a chance for them to bring their trade goods to to bear a keep and have a private audience um, and then they're they're in a few days set to go off by train to the capital um, and they are They are, th this is definitely a lot of showiness associated with the pilgrimage. There's a few really sort of like into it pious people who are into like, you know, living clean lives and eating simply and not having excessive wine while they're on pilgrimage. But most of them are really looking forward to this, to this as a, as a trip to the capital where they can conduct some business um, and also score some points with uh, institutions in the capital. Um, so uh, there's there's about there's about eleven real pilgrims, but uh, there's you know certainly servants, apprentices, and things like that, kind of along with them. And that includes a uh, priest, but most priests are uh, people who are wealthy and kind of have that as sort of a part-time political appointment in in that area. So that's it's really just a just like oh you're wealthy you can take on the the you know you, you're elected priest this year for the, the and you're you know you, you you know you do a lot of big pious things so we'll we'll sort of appoint you as priest this year to kind of take care of that. Uh, and like I said, a few of them are very sincerely pious, but there's a lot of there's a lot of behavior we, you would not. They certainly would be. They would be terrible fake pilgrims. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but but I imagine uh, from my background, I I kind of understand like you know I, I understand like the, the the approach right that uh, right. these pilgrims have. Oh yeah yeah yeah. There, you've certainly seen that before. Um, and uh, but yeah, it's yeah the strong Canterbury Tale vibes, except even yeah. well, just only the wealthy, only the wealthy pilgrims there. Um, yeah, yeah, but it would it would it would be it would be hard to fake this level of of just kind of flagrant impiety on some of them. Um, not really even trying. Yeah. Uh, it's also really unusual that they're getting aboard the train. Like, you know, theoretically you should just, you should make this on foot. A fake pilgrim would definitely make a big, make a way bigger show of, of, uh, right. All right. Um, Noman, what are you up to? What have you been up to today? Yeah. So, um, I think today I'm feeling kind of, you know, Sad. What and, animal form have you taken currently yeah, right now as, as think, evening approaches? You can shift during the day as long as you don't try to take a human form. Yeah. Um, so I am a kind of like a brown rat, like nothing very extraordinary about me, except maybe my eyes, but only those that pay really close attention would notice that. Uh, but nobody, nobody remembers. So. I'm, I'm kind of scuttling through the walls. Uh, I, I sense that there are new folk here, and I I, I found that I can listen very well uh, from within the walls. Uh, do you want to make an intellect check there? Sure. My intellect is not very good. We'll have to see how this goes. Oh, oh no, this is very sad. I'm rolling very high. Oh no! You uh, you definitely uh, you definitely can listen in. You're just getting a lot of talk about business they're hoping to do with the Archon. Uh, there's definitely a, a lot of business uh, discussions about you know how much better they're going to have a trade relationship with the capital that's way improved. They might even negotiate a train line extension to their district. Um, 
and then uh, there's you know definitely people who are talking about how how old and kind of uh, devoid of modern conveniences these old castles are. There's there's a lot of that kind of talk, but not a lot of actual like useful information that you're able to sort of like nail down. Um, uh, you, you do note that they're they're frustrated that the Archon is is waiting until the evening to officially greet them because they were really hoping that the, the reason they, they did not take they, they scheduled so much time in Bureau Keep was specifically to spend a lot of time negotiating with the Archon. Uh, Lucy. So I think Lucy is definitely interested in that eye. Um, so Lucy knows that this is something that sorcerers use. Do they know much else beyond that? Like you said it was a weird vantage point. So I assume that, that the eye doesn't have like 365 like... No, no, no. It was it's 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 a little like a a floating eye that looks a little kind of disguises itself as a star. Uh, they don't like most things from the underworld. They don't deal with direct sunlight particularly well, so they they don't hang around during the day, which also helps it disguise itself as a star for the casual mm -hmm. observer. Um, Good. So if I know that it wouldn't hang around in the day. Um, I'm probably going to fly up to where it was and see if I can figure out why it would be up over the East Tower. Let's go ahead and make an intellect check again. All right. Hmm. I got it. Ooh, this time I did get a critical success on the nose. Nice, nice. Um, uh, the vantage point you're at, has a lovely look at both the, the big windows for the Archon's apartment the concert's apartment and the uh, check a note here. Um, And the uh, stables, uh, which, you know, it's kind of a big sort of complex. It's like the stables, the kennels. Um, it's a that old eastern tower. It's also the abandoned tower. Um, so it's not like anybody would be up there. And it gives you a kind of a nice view of the, the nobles side of the keep where the the family's apartments are uh as well as a glance at the uh a glance at the uh the stables where there's um <clears throat> where there's a uh, you know the dogs cats uh that's also where the hunters gather and the game wardens people like that um But as you, uh, you know, you, you know, hovering is not, you know, kind of there. But you can, you can get up there and, and sort of do a spiral or two. Uh, would you make a uh, agility check, equal or under? One. 
Wolf, your party loves me today for some reason. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you notice one of the pilgrims, someone young with them, probably one of their apprentices or uh, kind of pages, uh, spot you and start to call other people over. And I think that's when you know that you need to kind of do the, the quick fall out of the sky thing. Uh, and then sort of sneak back into the keep from another spot. But definitely, uh, you, uh, uh, definitely spotted, uh, definitely like saw sort of roughly why the eye might be there. It also occurs to you at night that would be a really good, you know, at night during the day, you can't really see in people's windows because light contrast and all that. At night, uh, when the when those apartments are lit with candles and the the world around them is dark, you should be able, you might be able to see more into those windows, especially now that it's spring and people are opening their windows more and keeping them open during conversations and receptions and things like that. Esh, what have you been up to today? You had a wild dream last night i think i've been exploring i think i probably spent some time uh, i was down in the catacombs uh for a little bit staring at this statue and i think i went to the library to try to find some maps see if i could like space out where this what the what the tracks that this uh writer had taken uh and then when that inevitably fails because dream routes aren't logical i'm guessing um i think i just can i leave the keep is it is that a thing that happens in this world certainly but do you want to check how you did in the library first oh cool yes let's have you roll intellect i mean um i got it five we're all four, academically two. adjacent here we should know that you know library trips are, are fruitful things happen in libraries absolutely in libraries, yeah uh, interesting things happen in libraries. Uh, how'd you do? Uh, five. Uh, five. All right. Um, the forest maps uh, are in many places very detailed. The forest is a preserve of the keep. It's sort of like, you know, kind of the Archon's domain. Um, he doesn't go all King John or Sheriff of Nottingham mean he doesn't prevent people from hunting or gathering or foraging there but certainly regulates it as a sort of a preserve uh the village that you have visited before is certainly on the map um based on what you remember from your dream um there's sort of a weird dark zone of the forest on the map that those trails or paths seem to have led into that are oddly not detailed on any versions of the map you have. Uh, and on one version of the map, there is a distinct change in the pigments used to do the cartography, where they go from a, you know, nice sort of Tolkien-esque suggestive colors, where it's a nice variations of green for, you know, forest, where they all fade to a really dark, dark, uh, almost almost a indigo or, or, a, or a soot based inks um, for that area. I mean, they're, they're, it's nicely, weirdly old map detailed leaves, but they, they shift in color from uh, sort of the, the nature uh, green and earth tone colors to uh, oddly dark when they sort of detail the, the dead zone. Um, and all the detail in the dead zone is just trees. There's, it doesn't show any paths. It doesn't show any, and it's not very large. There's a few, there's an abandoned ruin, some standing stones on sort of what would be the far side of the dead zone uh, that you've not been to, but you know other people have traveled to roughly within a day, kind of depending on travel conditions and weather and how long, how much light you get um, from the village. There's other things that you recognize as landmarks on space in the dead zone that none of them are, are huge trips from the keep. Uh, but the dead zone is oddly not detailed and roughly the same shape and size in, in pretty much every map you look at. Um, 
where it's just sort of just detailed as sort of a blob of trees uh, with no paths or uh, and like I said, this is a this is a preserve of the Archon, and uh, it's it's got significantly more detail than a lot of other forest in the in the in the region might have. Um, since uh, the game wardens need to know where to game and warden, um, it occurs to you that uh, there was no deterioration on the stones you saw in your dream. And uh, the statue you see is roughly the same color. It's almost as like they were trying to find a stone color that would remind them of that, but is not nearly as durable. Um, it may be the it may be the sculpture. It may be the that it was a it was stone it, it, a similar but different character of stone. It may have been the fact that it was to so deeply carved or inexpertly carved that it started corroding. Uh, but the the statue in the keep looks very similar in terms of material. But not, but the the stones you saw in the thing you know is a graveyard. But as in your waking mind, cannot figure out why you know it's a graveyard. Um, were definitely not um, corroded or eroded the way that that is in the the the, the statue in the catacombs is. Um, and then, uh, did you want to try to head out of the keep? Yeah, I think from that, I th uh, I'm guessing that uh, from what you said, it's too long of a, it's too long to travel today. Uh, so I think I'm going to try to get as far as I can where there are going to be fewer like uh, fewer tracks, mm -hmm. um, and just see if to see if what I saw in my dream was something that actually happened, uh, or if it's this is something to come. Uh, so I'm looking for footprints. I think. Or prints, however. Or, yeah. Um, I'll have you do another intellect check. Uh, it's a fourteen on a fifteen. Nice. Uh, there's not obvious tracks. But it does strike you that uh, how often do you do you travel this way to like the old ruined areas, or is that something you just do occasionally because pe other people are interested? Is it something you personally have, have tried to explore and travel? Uh, I don't think so. I, pr I think I probably usually keep to the keep. Um, okay. I think I associate the outside world with the trauma of of the of, of my um, past experience uh, out there. Um, so yeah. All right. The uh, the uh, so you've only you've only been here a couple of times, but in your dream, you you pretty much got every twist and turn in this trail. You know, there's a few trails I hike a couple of times a year, and I'm all there's there's many things I I do not remember until I'm on top of them, and even then I'm like, whoa, I didn't remember this going over a creek before, but. Hey, I guess it did, uh, and uh, but you your dream nailed odd details of this path, Toby. Yeah, uh, and uh, there's no signs of passage. It's also for middle of the afternoon in the woods. It is in spring. It is oddly quiet. Okay. Creepy. Um, uh, Lucy, you just dive bombed out of the sky really quickly. <laughs> there is an apprentice you will recognize who you're pretty sure saw you, but you got out. You got down fast enough that uh, you don't think anybody else. Um, so, did you? Do you think you came down inside the castle walls, behind a building, or outside the castle walls, and trying to get back in? Um, probably. If I thought I was spotted, probably outside. 
the castle walls. Okay. What's your What's your plan for getting back in? Uh, do are there yeah. guards who know you, or 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 do there so, guards? Do you have a Do you have a disguise that the guards the guards know, or is there a guard who knows who you are and what you are and lets you in? Or so I was thinking, like going with what I ended up rolling in character creation that um, that Arcaneer that knows who I am. Um, if so, I, I probably use the kind of airship travel to get in and out, um, especially since I can fly. So maybe, maybe not a guard at like the city gates, but maybe the guards around like the airship yards. Um, maybe there's a guard there that knows what I'm about. Or your Arcaneer. Or the Arcaneer, yeah. Did you name that person? I did. I named him Torque. Torque. Nice. Imagine he's like, I just imagined a big, burly, like almost like a Viking like dude. Uh, and uh, Autumn, where do you think, and Noman, where have you gone, the two of you? Uh, after uh, sort of doing some investigation within the keep. I, I think it would make sense for, I think uh, Anam would, would, would be interested in talking to, to Noman uh, just because of our previous encounter with, um, with pilgrims. And um, I don't know where this would happen. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the afternoon. Um, no one's a rat. Know, what is that? No one is a rat. Yeah. No one is, is yeah. a rat. Or maybe yeah. I could be, I can change shape like during the day just so long as it's not human, right? Right, right. So maybe I could be like a cat or something, something that's maybe a little less despised. Um, and maybe you know this cat. Uh, maybe this is one that like, comes often begging for scraps. Yeah. And what is your raven's name? Uh, I named my raven, uh, and I gave it a name. It's uh, Rivel. So let's start with, uh, I think, Lucy Nash, it sounds like you are both outside the keep walls. Uh, and, and perhaps, Esh, you see a familiar form go crashing to the ground behind an airship outside the keep. The town is uh, about a 30 minute walk away. The keep is sort of up on a hill. It's not far as the crow flies, but it's far as the human walks. Um, so there's just a little bit of space inside and outside the walls of the keep, uh, or it's, it's up on a kind of sea cliff. So it's a little bit of space inside and outside the walls of the keep for, uh, airships to land uh, and, you know, small dirigibles to land. Uh, and uh, it sounds like, Ash, you are coming up the, the trail from the woods, uh, having done a little bit of, you know, heavy hiking, possibly a little bit of scrambling to get back up to the, uh, the trail to the keep from the woods. Uh, and uh, there's definitely spaces sort of low down where it's easier for a horse to go off the rail, but like right here, it's, you know, you're either sort of walking up the trail from the town or you're kind of scrambling up the side of the hill to get to the, the area outside. Uh, Torque is uh, working on uh, uh, I think Torque is working on a series of I guess engines is is the best word for them that uh, would propel a dirigible faster and farther than it might normally want to travel, uh, left only to the wind. Uh, on an otherwise pretty small dirigible, it's got a, a small sort of a, 
uh, cabin sort of attached. Uh, the balloon's inflated, uh, but it's sort of tethered down as he is working on some some large brass engines um, there. And Esh, you see uh, a familiar form fold its wings and go diving sort of behind the uh, the dirigible there. Uh, what do you do? Do I know Torque, or do I just know uh, Lucy? Yeah, I usually set this up as a, you know, you would know everybody. I, I think when I first started running this, I set it up as a, this is the second season of Barrow Keep, the series. You were all the breakout stars. Uh, everybody was surprised exactly how popular these four characters became. <coughs> um, and, uh, Which means we can't die, guys. Keep that yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is also George R. R. Martin's and Inspirations, so... Uh, you never know. Sometimes it really feels like he just rolled a die and just like they're dead, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I think. Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you see, you see, Lucy uh, fold their wings and uh, kind of come out of the sky. Uh, does Lucy normally try to keep a low profile from normal residents of the keep or only from visitors? I think everybody, um, like, just because of the the fear of being sent back to wherever they've been called from. Nice. All right. So, Ash, what do you do? Um, I think I... I mean, I'm heading towards... This is a, at the airship yard, right? That's where I'm yeah. headed. And so, it's, you know, it's a little sliver of land. There's room for about an airship. Right. Um, I think I'm heading there to, you know, make the last uh, the last leg of this trip back to the keep. I think maybe I'm running late a little bit or um, I'm just tired. And I see uh, Lucy fall from the sky. Um, I don't know if I'm familiar enough with Lucy to know if it's intention if, if it's an intentional fall, like if this is under control or if this is just a it's under control but fast. Okay. Uh, so it's I definitely a dive, not a fall, but you know. Yeah. So I think I'm rushing to Lucy, kind of nervous, but not too like not nervous that they're dead, but nervous that like why why are you making such a, a speedy uh, retreat? Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm tracking down Lucy. Well played. Uh, Lucy, you see Torque turn and look at you in surprise. And uh, you also see Esh kind of moving towards you, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, if, if Torque has noticed me, um, I imagine Lucy kind of moves around, you know, hiding behind objects, using shadow as much as possible, and has a pretty, like, it's a pretty agile little imp. Um, so... Once Lucy notices that they've been kind of spotted by Torque, um, the the agile sneaking around demeanor kind of just drops, and uh, Lucy says to Torque, uh, "Oh, what you working on?" Uh, Torque looks really confused. Just. And uh, just, just the ship, just, just the ship. Uh, uh all the all the gears turning today, Torque. You were kind of kind of uh, out of it. Uh, I all the all the all, everything is working great. Everything is. 
working absolutely fine. I think, Esh, you are up there at this point, correct? You're not like holding back or, or waiting for Lucy to finish a conversation or anything like that. Oh, no, yeah. I'm just, I'm shouting, Lucy, Lucy, you okay? What, what's going on? Um, I'm gonna take a quick look around and make sure there's nobody else here aside from Tork and Esh. What, what, what is going on? Uh, that's, that's a good question. That's a, an excellent question. What is going on? Uh, hey, Ash. Uh, come talk to Thor. It seems, uh, seems really good today. I, I think I'm just noticing that Torque is there. Like I, I saw Torque, but that wasn't my concern in running up the, the hill. Uh, and I, I look... Good afternoon, Turk. Uh, how how are you doing? I'm I'm great. I am perfect. I am in. What what is going on? Uh, I think Lucy. Um, so Lucy has the the ability to sense magic. Why don't um, you make that check? All right. Uh, so I clicked reroll. I got a one again. I don't know if, uh, so this is where we'll introduce the notion of difficulty. So the difficulty okay. is, and I can bore you with how difficulty is calculated, but there's a, a nice quick, um, whenever you're rolling against someone and you, if you feel like it didn't reroll, if you didn't see it spin, that's fine too. Uh, it's fun. I just thought it was weird that it rolled the same number, but we'll go with it. I think it rolled. Okay. Uh, so this one has a difficulty of one. So you want to get equal to or under your ability score, but while beating the difficulty, which is why one is not a critical success. Um, and one is usually, or sorry, difficulty is usually calculated if, if I can do I can do it sort of arbitrarily if there's just a tough situation. Uh, but whenever you're working in opposition to somebody else, the difficulty is their hit die minus your level, and you are level one. Uh, you can make a guess about uh, about uh, his hit die um, from there, uh, but his difficulty was one. So uh, you do not notice anything particularly magical or non-magical. It just, you know, perhaps it is the, the weird residual alchemical and uh, artificery of uh, of uh, airship engines, uh, but there's nothing peculiarly magical right now. But then it, your your senses may also just feel off. Uh, you also just came down really fast. Your head's a little swimming. Uh, your feet are a little sore. If that's where you caught yourself on your on your feet. Um, but this dude is is definitely there's something weird about him, right? Like we that what we're reading. Uh, it seems like what would you like to make an intellect check again? This is a difficulty of one for either one of you. Go ahead, go ahead, Ray. Uh, sure. And I rolled an eight, which is a under my intellect of eleven. Uh, yeah, there's definitely something really off or unusual about the way Torque is. Maybe it's it's you know, fear, anxiety, exhaustion. All of those could be factors. In which case, can I use an archetype ability at this point to touch mind? You might, yeah. Uh, while taking a moment to focus on a specific individual, the seer may make an intellect text to ask that individual player's that individual's player two questions about their intentions. Mm -hmm. That does individual refer to NPC here as well, or is yeah, this one yeah, okay. it does. All right, that's a two. 
Um, uh, that is good. Why don't you ask me a couple of questions? Or ask me one question first and then see what you want to ask for the second question. What What is distracting Torque? He doesn't seem to be answering questions in in any kind of depth or in sort of a distant way. So I think I'm, I'm what is distracting him right now? Uh, there's kind of a blankness there. Uh, you feel like a looking busy and it's not a, something he's articulating. It's, it's a sense of not knowing. Like he's of looking busy and not really knowing things. Does that make sense? Yeah. What's the last thing that he remembers with clarity? Uh, the last thing he remembers... With clarity, um, not being sure what the tools do. Hmm. Well, this is not a mechanic I want working on my dirigibles. So definitely not extending, not, not adding propulsion engines to them. You know. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I turn to Lucy and and say, I, I don't know how familiar you are with Torque, but I, I sort of wave my hands in his face. I don't know that he's entirely with us right now. Oh, you say yeah. that? I'm sorry? Do you say that out loud? Yes. All right. To Lucy. Um, and as soon as you you say that, uh, Torque makes a dive for the tree line. Like just right past you, hmm. uh, like running straight to the tree line. Drops the tools, anything that might slow him down, uh, and goes straight to the tree line. And as that happens, you're pretty sure you see a look on Torque's face as his kind of mouth goes into kind of a wide, flat. It is, his mouth is a little too big and uh, there's all the teeth are pointed almost like a, a cat's mouth except human size and across a face rather than across a snout uh, and uh, there's diving for the tree line what do the two of you do? So Lucy just goes, the chase is afoot, and dive bombs off into the tree line. Uh, why don't you make, let's uh, let's start real quick with uh, Lucy, make an agility check. This is just to see if he's a little faster than you. And then we're going to make a physique check if you're good at that. I don't think this is something. Inesh, you can make an agility check too if you would like to. Oh, I'm not running. Okay, I'm exhausted from this uh, from this trip. You did just scramble up a hill, like a. All right, I rolled a thirteen, and my agility is fourteen. So nice, yeah. You get you uh. You you can attempt to uh to kind of grab him, or uh, whatever you'd like to do. What are you doing? You are yeah. sitting dive bombing. What are you? Are you trying to grab? Are you trying to knock down? Are you trying to uh, get oh. his feet out from under him? I want so my 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 intent was to fly as fast as he was running, and like try to converse with him while I'm flying and he's running. Oh yeah, yeah. What are you What are you saying? So I'm like gliding next to him. I'm like, uh, I don't remember Torque having those teeth. 
Uh, and he is about to hit the tree line. Do you want to stop him from doing that? It will be hard for you to keep pace with him. Yeah, so... On the wing versus somebody on the ground. Yeah, so I have... Um... You can try to get in front of him and block his way. You can try to grab him, Any, any, anything like that. Yeah, I think I'll, what I'll do is I'll... Uh... Um, so I have, I, I assume as a, a level as a level one imp, I can cast one of my spells a day. Oh yeah. All right. So I have supernatural reflexes, um, and so I do want to try to to trip him, but I want to do it by like flying between his legs um, to get him. Like so, I don't want to get kicked, but I do want to trip him up and make him fall over. So. One second. I get so spellcasting in this comes out of your hit points. You're going to invest a certain number of hit points uh, uh, into this, um, and uh, those hit points. Um, Give me one second. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I messed that up. This is what I get for running too many different systems. I apologize. <laughs> Man, I should le I should learn my the the different systems to run better. Robbie, please make this look great when when. when <laughs> I don't want to embarrass Diogo. Um, uh, how fast would you like to be moving there? Um, like I said, oh, fast enough faster. that I can that I can trip him up and still not get kicked by him. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, it requires. Yeah. And, and what I was that? You want to be able to like spin, kind of like, you know, rings around him, and you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're trying to trip him up so that he kind of like has to stop, and sort of get up off the ground. Yeah, I do want to make him. I do want to make him like kind of tumble before the tree line, so he nice. doesn't make it. All right. So uh, you're going to. Um, you're just going to uh, make a willpower check right now and that's equal to or under your willpower okay. fingers crossed here yes rolled an 8 and my willpower is a 12 or 13 alright yeah so you yeah. are this one check is going to be at advantage for your agility to uh, as you uh, gain supernatural speed and uh, deafness and uh, literally fly around between his legs without getting kicked uh, and make you're going to add a you're going to make that agility roll twice and take the best one. Okay. And is best here high or low? Best is whichever one you think is best. Oh, interesting. Um, oh. <laughs> huh. Well, I and it really will be one for the agility check. Okay. Um, I guess I'm going to say that I'm, 18 sounds best to me. Uh, what's your willpower? Um... My willpower, I believe, is 12. Okay, so the, the one that's equal to or under your willpower is be while beating a one is the best. Uh, well, in that case, if it was a willpower check, I failed because I rolled a 13 and an 18. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Sorry, we had already passed the willpower check. What was your agility yeah. check? I apologize. Ah, I, 
So is that so the advantage was on a uh, an agility move. check? What okay. it looks like. Then I will take the thirteen. Or, and all right, so take, take the thirteen, the yeah. and uh, he goes sprawling onto the ground, uh, and does not look like torque at all. After he goes sprawling, he sort of has. If you put cat ears on a quasi human skull and then a, a, a wide sort of cat-like mouth with only a slight snout uh, and definitely a very cat-like nose like the the turn up the um, but definitely Torx clothes which don't fit him as well as uh, they might and let's shift and talk before we end a little bit to uh Anam and Noman, uh, who are, and uh, Noman, you are still a rat. Can you speak, or a cat, can you speak in animal form, or do you kind of find animalish ways to communicate? Or do you rely on Anam's ability to talk to animals to talk to you? Um, I don't know. Uh, I feel like I might have like some kind of like way to kind of telepathy wise i don't know if that's too out there but i, I feel like definitely anam during the day is the person that's easiest for you to communicate with yeah no i would agree anam never makes you like go through a big pantomime if any of you know michael lombardi he was the original play tester for the revenant and he he loved rat pan rat paw pantomime oh my god <laughs> He would go. He would go hours without talking because he just like, <laughs> the rat could not talk. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, yeah, if you would like, definitely Anam is the easy person to communicate with. Yeah. If you have questions or frustrations, because mm -hmm. he talks to animals, and I think yeah, I think like it is easy for you to make basic intentions known. You might like complex ideas. Defending well, your master's thesis here. would be tough. Yeah, yeah I, I imagine if this was a TV show or a movie that, that the director would have fun because you'd get a shot where the two of us are, you know, conducting uh, a normal conversation, but then it probably would occasionally cut to somebody who views this from outside <laughs> and, and just thinking that, you know, Anam was, you know, talking gibberish, right? Uh, I think Anam animals. frequently sounds like a person talking to an animal. <laughs> Yeah, it's the fact that like the t the conversation just changes direction as if the animal was responding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, I will warn Anam. Um, one of the things that I am carrying on me are fleas. So many fleas. So if that is something that you are not uh, keen have you on, not, have you not been groomed as a cat in a while? No, I do not take cat form often. Yeah, well, I think Anam would, would then, like, if you're sitting on a bench, he would just say, okay, sit on that side of the bench, and I'll sit sit on on this side. Uh, I don't really want to have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wearing, Anam is used to wearing pretty nice, elegant-looking clothes, and, and uh, you know, it, the dinner is, is going to be a fancy dinner, right? So I, I want to be sure dinner. that I'm... I'm uh, I'm not covered with uh, with fur or fleas. Uh, I want to kind of keep myself pristine. I think Noman is gonna look at you with very uh, just saddened eyes and just kind of lick his paw. Uh, but but Anam uh, would say, you know, Noman, uh, don't be. Uh, don't be so down. Uh, you know, last time we had uh, pilgrims in the in the house, things got kind of exciting for us. Although these seem like a very different type of, of pilgrim. Uh, th these actually seem like uh, legitimate pilgrims, which in some ways means not really pilgrims at all. I think I think no one's going to kind of like look at you and I think maybe you hear like this kind of uh, like w wispy kind of breathy voice in your head uh, I don't like the look of these ones 
Yeah, well, um, is there a reason why, or, or do you have a general, uh, a, a general bias against uh, guest pilgrims taking up uh, temporary uh, lodging with us? No, no, these, these, these ones just seem, they bring trouble. They bring well, death. They stink of it. Speaking of, uh, speaking of trouble, um, I was, uh, I was uh, a little troubled in my sleep last night. Um, there seems to have been some uh, some intruder of some sort that was making their way by the the kennel last night. I know you are often out and about uh, in the evening. Did you uh, did anything happen to you last night? Anything uh, disturb your uh, your meanderings through the keep? I am always greatly disturbed. You know this. Um, it was it was bad last night. That smell. It was awful. Um, Anam sniffs the air. Probably says, "Well, I mean." Probably right now, I, I'm 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 smelling the 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 food. Right, if if we're anywhere near where the the dinner would be, we would probably be smelling uh, that that food. But says, but uh, it is interesting that you mentioned a strange smell last night. Um, I uh, after being wakened by the barking dogs, I did make my way down to uh, the kennel and. Uh, the hackles were raised on those dogs, and uh, some of them seem to have caught uh, the scent of. Uh, well, they told me cat, but I, I, I have a feeling. Don't be offended. I, I don't think it was your kind of cat that they were that they were uh, disturbed by, but they they also were disturbed by some type of other scent that seemed to come from deep in the woods. I think Noman's going to look at the woods and say, uh, dark things have come from those woods. Dark things are in these walls, even as we speak. And he's going to turn to look at the, 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 the castle. Yeah, I'm, uh, well, uh, I know that the castle has had a troubled history. The keep has had a troubled history. Um, and uh, I don't know, being surrounded by these woods often kind of sets uh, animals and, and others on edge. So, um, but I, I don't know, last night seemed a, a little bit different for those dogs. I mean, I, they've been wakened before by animals and such kind of in the in the area, things that have spooked them. But last night uh, seems to have been a little bit different for them. I think this is when, what is Sinan like, Esh? And are Sinan's, what are Sinan's pronouns, I should also ask? That is going to be uh, he, him. Okay. And, and personality-wise, ingratiating, snobby. I think shrewd, um, like keeps, keeps to themselves, uh, keeps their own counsel. Um, knows their knows their place in court and how to manipulate it uh, and I think uh, you see a face that you don't see very often on them. 
Uh, and it's Sinan. And Sinan is walking directly towards you. Um, it sounds a little like Sinan is a, a still sort of like leftover from the old family. Or at least Sinan's, Sinan's family is sort of leftover from the old family uh, that used to be here. It could be their, their connection with a usurper. Uh, and uh, Sinan gives you a very proper uh, sort of half waist bow. Um, and unfolds his gloves as if he's going out uh, or to the stables to get a horse. And is like, uh, it's just, Anum, have you seen Esh? Um, I, I, of course, have seen Esh, although I'm assuming you are asking whether I've seen today. Esh. Have you today. seen Esh today? Uh, Anum scratches his head and says, uh, I don't think I have seen uh, Esh today. Uh, why do you ask? I'm sorry, it's for, this is information for people who are members or wards of the, the family. If, if uh, I'm sorry, this is, it's not something I can share. And you hear oh. him sort of under his breath sort of say, not something you'd be concerned about. Uh oh, of of course. Uh uh I, I wouldn't I wouldn't dare to presume upon uh secret communications among uh among the the elite of the of the keep and gives a wink. It's a matter of some gravity if you would S. Esh to uh, please meet with Ilias whenever it's convenient for him to be at the keep. Uh, I would most appreciate it. Uh, very well. I um, I certainly will keep my eye open. Uh, it, it looks like you are setting out for you, you said it, it seemed like he was heading for the stables. Yes. He is dressed uh, for writing. This is, uh, so uh, looks like you are up for uh, a late afternoon, early evening jaunt. It is important that I take a look at some of the trails nearby. There is a missing person. Oh, a, a missing person. Uh, I have spoken too much already. He's got two guards sort of coming towards him and he gestures to go get the horses. You'll understand you are not in a position to have access to private information. Oh, of course. I'm, 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 I'm completely here at the disposal of uh, the Archon. I know my place in the castle, of course. Nods kind of abruptly and just, uh, if you would tell Ash to speak to the consort, I would most appreciate it. Uh, of course, I, I am, I am of course at your service, but I, I, I do this in a very artificial way. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, saying this, but it's it's clearly just a, a rehearsed spiel. And uh, it would be appreciated if you would stay near the keep for the next few days until very close to the keep for the next few days. I'm certain I speak for the Archon when I say that. Well, of course, if, if you speak, if you speak for the Archon, uh, then of course I will, I will 
do as you say. I would never do anything to displease the Archon. And he uh, lets out a sigh and walks off to meet the guards with the horses, mounts and sort of heads out of the keep uh, and down the road to town, toward oh. town. Yeah, I, I think one thing I, I would try to do, and I, I would probably ask Noman if he wanted to uh, accompany me, which would be uh, when it's safe to make my way over to the stable, which you said had the kennels nearby. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think I would want to uh, ask uh, some of the dogs nearest to the stable whether they had just recently picked up the scent of anything that reminded them of a scent that they picked up uh, during the evening. I want to ask you to check for that. Yeah, that's, that's there, there. No, no, no. Okay. And they, I think they specifically say not close, not nearby. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I think with that, uh, I mean, this is kind of curious information. Uh, and I think, uh, Anam, we'll ask Noman, like, Noman, what did you make of all of that? A very odd man, uh, a missing person. Have you noticed anyone missing? Well, I, I don't really keep a roster and uh, a careful track of things. Uh, but I, I would say one thing that's odd is is the, the dinner is about to start. Uh, it's, Senan it, it's definitely the time to get dressed now. Yeah, and, and Sinan doesn't strike me as the kind of person who would turn down an elegant meal. Um, and that, that Sinan would, would be feeling like this is the the time to kind of go off on some uh, horse uh, riding venture just uh, seems a little a little odd to me. Um, but I, I think what 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 I would uh, want, I, I think I you know would say to Noman, uh, well, I think we best maybe keep our eye out for for Esh uh, and uh, let Esh. Uh, know what uh, what has transpired. Pass along the net the message, but also uh, maybe mention to 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 Ash the the um, sense that somebody in the keep has gone missing. Yeah, I think you see Noman nod, and then I think that Noman's going to leap up into your arms and just kind of like do that like head thing that cats <laughs> to do into your like head. <laughs> Ah, it's going to be a long getting dressed for dinner. <laughs> uh, I would like to wrap here and see if you guys have any questions, wishes. Uh, uh, I'd, love, I'd love to do a round of stars and wishes, but just also see if you guys have any questions. I uh, know we're headed right straight till two, right, Robbie? That's correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, so, uh, Thank you guys. I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens next week. Um, but uh, first, I, I'd love to do a round of stars and then a round of wishes. And does everybody know the stars and wishes framework? Robbie, should we say it for anybody list what, what that is for anybody yeah. listening? So the, the stars and wishes are a chance to sort of give stars uh, as a, a, a moment of praise for something you appreciated that somebody did in game. Uh, well, it can be aimed at anybody in game. Uh, sometimes we even toss stars out to the designer. Uh, but I praise Diogo all the time, so somebody's gonna. But besides me, is gonna have to say nice things about Diogo. Uh, so, uh, um, and then we follow that up with a round of wishes, which are things you would love to see during the next session, uh, whether that's changes or something to build on or something that you didn't get to quite see this session that you're really hoping for, uh, and a chance to really talk about things that are really you're excited to see. Uh, and then just a time for any questions that you guys want to bring up. And uh, Robbie, as the host, I'll, I'll toss it to you to do stars first. Um, uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, first of all, Richard, thank you for agreeing to do this. It was- It uh, is a huge uh, pleasure, yeah. Yeah. 
this was yeah a delightful time and um i uh you know i, I like the i like the setup of this so much that that it it, it, it immediately becomes very rich with uh, all sorts of uh, you know relationships and and rivalries and kind of intrigue uh, and I, I think you know as a as a kind of narrative generating system I mean it, it just gives you so much kind of there uh, and, and develops it so quickly um, and uh, stars also just to uh, the, the players uh, and and I like. I mean, just regularly seeing kind of uh, decisions being made that are very much kind of character driven uh, decisions. So that like even little things like when uh, when uh, Lucy was was out uh, tripping up uh, Torque, uh, the decision that that, you know, Aaron makes to have Ash decide no, it's it's been a long weary weary walk. Why would I go kind of chasing after after the guy running away? Right? I mean, that was just like you know completely in character and just you know situation relevant. Right? I mean, it, it was like motivated by the by the relevance of that. And Laura, I like uh, I like your your brooding uh, uh, unhappy uh, revenant who, unfortunately, this time seem to be the kind of lightning rod for all the bad roles right but then you you kind of also kind of incorporated that into your into your uh into your character and and i i enjoy uh i enjoy our our imp lucy also immensely with uh uh you know uh the the yeah and and i think also just kind of nice decisions being made in terms of following up on like those opening scenes with you know lucy you know, interestingly, having the the ability precisely to kind of go up and fly where that uh, where that uh, eye in the sky would have appeared, and and be able to kind of do that, uh, you know, that bit of of uh, information gathering, but then also kind of turning it in the next scene into that interesting piece with uh, with Torque. And I will, unless somebody would like to go next. Would like to jump in. I'm not shy at all about like just calling on people. This is I used to be an English teacher, so you know. Uh, uh, I also really ahead, just sorry. enjoyed. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you, all you, sir. I really enjoyed the um, the setup, the provocative details that you offered, and I was going to say it at the time, but didn't want to break your stride, something about doing character prep and then having 15 minutes to design a uh, entire uh, sort of sequence uh, is terrifying to me and uh, very, very impressive. Also. I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not just shooting in the dark. So, uh, but you, uh, Beyond the Wall gave me some, some really good ideas for scenario packs. And I've, I've, I've sort of, so that was kind of a, these are all riffs on stuff that was done, what, that were done in Beyond the Wall, so. Uh, but yeah, the storytelling was was really good. Thank, Thank you. you. I can go next. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, stars to everyone. This is great. I'm loving all the characters that we developed, and I'm really loving all the dialogue that we're getting in. I thought that we uh, we had some great great scenes, um, and I, I I just really love how we're all sticking to characters. Um, it, it's, it's great fun. No, I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah. No, everything was great. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan, all you. So, I mean, I'll echo everything that's been said. Um, I love, love, love this character creation pro and world building process. Like it's, and I mean, to, to kind of, play off something that Aaron said I've uh watching Richard kind of like the way that you do it you know I've, I've played beyond the wall with you once before now playing Pharaoh keep with you but the way that you manage I mean the system's great but the way you manage it is great too um I I'm currently running a beyond the wall and I did not like I got tips from you watching you do it so um 
Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Which 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 scenario pack are you using? <laughs> I unwittingly chose the same one that you did when you ran the Caverns of Thracia. Right. Uh, so I'm doing the the I think it's called the the Hidden Cult. The I think Hidden it's Cult. Yeah. Um, first and, level for those of you who don't know Thracia as a is a classic major dungeon, but the first level is a cult. So I introduced Thracia by have, running the Hidden Cult scenario pack from Beyond the Wall. And I didn't want to use Thracia, so I used. Um, uh, keep on the borderlands, which is a it's a very similar you know, but yeah. it's a D kind of basic thing. Um, but it was just funny that I did the same. I did not mean to choose the same scenario. My players actually chose it, and so oh, this, nice, okay. So the setup was very similar. Like it was just really funny setting it up. Like I remember this. I didn't know this was what was going on. And <laughs> so, um, so yeah. But like the system's wonderful. Um, stars to you for the way you do it, because like like I said, I got tips from watching you do it. Um, and stars to all the players, like everybody said. I, I especially enjoyed, um, what was Lara's character, uh, Noman as the cat in that scene. Yeah. Um, I did see your chat pop up that you were rubbing against uh, Sinan's leg, and like that was just so, yeah. So. Nice, yeah. That was, great, great. That, that was also just a beautiful image of you sitting next to the cat having a conversation. So start all around. That was a great session. Thank you. Uh, and I'll sneak back and start with you, Ryan. Uh, wishes for our next session. I don't know if I have. Um, I guess I the only the only wish I really have is just. I mean, uh, I've now got to have a little bit of mischief. Uh, I just want to create more trouble with everybody at the party in the next uh, the next session. Um, fly around and be annoying and mischievous there as well. So just more of the same. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Lara, anything you're sort of wishing for next session? Yeah. Um, I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, no er, Noman taking human form, and I'm hoping I can do that at the party. Um, and I'm just looking forward to interacting with the other characters, having some dialogue dialogue scenes there. So, yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, uh, same. I'm looking forward to uh, more interaction and. Uh, seeing more with some of these themes that we're starting to explore, uh, sort of the impenetrability of, um, of characters, of, of the setting, of uh, not being able to read things, not being able to see what's there in front of us. I, I like those themes. Awesome. Robbie, anything you'd like to um are there yeah well I, I i would say right now things are kind of deliciously unsettling right now because right there uh, you know you know I, I feel like people in the keep are probably used to being on edge that right it's it's in a kind of place and and given the history of 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 you know the the, the archon not being uh part of the the previous royal family i mean it seems like a a kind of 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 just a set, a setting where people are are often you, you know we realize that people show these public faces that are not really that they're really kind of all masks and that they're you know they're kind of behind the scenes there are all sorts of of kind of ploys and things that are going on so I, I think all of that is kind of deliciously coming out in this so I guess one of my wishes is just to kind of uh, unravel some of those. Uh, some of those strings a little bit to see where they where they lead. And in terms of my own character, I mean, I was just looking. At, I always like to look at my character sheet and say, okay, what's going on in this that uh, maybe I I need to lean into. And I think definitely uh, my Raven, which has has not really seen an opportunity to come into play, but I I have my my animal companion, which I imagine that next time I, I'll probably be thinking about ways to to bring that. Uh, that resource into play a little bit more. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank to all three of you. Um, I'd love to see if you guys have any questions, any thoughts. Uh, 
no, everything is still sort of in playtest and nothing has been in front of an editor yet. So that's why you see a lot of typos. Um, and uh, man, the Sharp Swords and Sinister Spells playbooks are way better shape than the the, the D and D BX playbooks. Uh, but uh, any thoughts, questions, anything you'd like to bring up, anything you'd like to know more about? Uh, I know we just about like five minutes, but I I do like um, uh, and I don't know if I've played um, Sharp Swords or in Sinister Spells, but I know. Richard, with you, I've played uh, um, another one of Diego's games. So, you yeah, know, the system Darker, is... Darker Secrets was a little simpler. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Diego's coming out with a new version of Sharp Swords and Sinister Spells that'll be a little bit more like uh, Dark Streets and Darker Secrets. But uh... yeah, but but I think one of the things I appreciate about it is, is that it, it, it's, uh, you know, one, once once you've rolled a couple of times with the system, it's very kind of easy to understand. And then that that way that it gives the GM a very easy way to kind of assign difficulties in addition to that and have that kind of neatly incorporated into the roles, uh, I think works uh, really well. And um, I know we're coming up against two o'clock, but Richard, I, and maybe we'll just reserve this for, for next time, but I, I would be interested in just kind of hearing a little bit more about like where exactly uh, kind of you came up with this uh, idea of the scenario packs, um, because I, I I find playing them that you know I'm 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 playing something like Dungeons and Dragons, but the kind of narrative that's spinning out of this is a very different type of of thing that I would than what I would usually get out of out of something like. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons or some type of old school game. Um, I think that, uh, and this is a long answer, and we can talk a little bit more about it next time. But I'll hit the highlights. I think the, uh, the, uh, I think that when I first read Beyond the Wall scenario packs, I was really excited because they they are a lot more about putting interesting characters in volatile situations, uh, which is really sort of like the original role playing pre Dungeons and Dragons game. That's really sort of the um, Dave Wesley's Bronstein games that never really got published. I mean, he's he's now gone back and published notes about what they used to be like, but that's where Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax kind of first encountered the notion of role-playing. Uh, and it sort of emerged from very specific Napoleonic era, or not, actually eight, earlier 18th century era, war games where Dave Wesley was like, you know, his group was already going like, oh, what were the commanders thinking? And so, so he decided like, let's visit this little town of Bronstein. And it's not going to be the commanders, sure, just the commanders. It's going to be a group of students. And some of them are really loyal to the German king. And some of them are really loyal to the French king. Uh, and the Bronstein, Bronstein is in the Rhine Valley. So uh, there's a lot of French loyalty and German loyalty uh, sort of splitting the town itself. And you have students coming in and sort of being kind of volatile political figures uh, at a very early stage of time when students did things like that. Um, and uh, and then you just have locals, like you just have the baker who just really just would like to not have his town blow up. And, and, uh, and then you have, you know, agents of the king who are undercover as other people and, um, and they're about to have a moment happen. And it's really just putting characters who are interesting in the context of that moment into a volatile situation, seeing what they do. Um, and I think that's what scenario packs kind of brought back for me. Um, otherwise, they use a very D&D &D sort of set of rules. Um, and uh, and they keep backstories very simple. The playbooks are, are fleshed out, but backstories are not. Some of you survived the 90s we all wrote five page backstories and that was, those were our short versions. You know, I feel like some characters, my backstory was longer than like some papers I did in grad school, you know, uh, it had as much as many citations and research notes, you know, um, but like it, it keeps backstories really simple. So you're really just looking at those things that will affect what you do in game. Like what are those things I know about myself that will affect what I do in game? Not, what is everything I know about myself ever? Mm -hmm. um, and so everybody else in the game is not responsible for a reading assignment to know what your character's going doing, you know? Um, 
uh, so that's what I that's that's really what I thought Beyond the Wall kind of brought back to the table um, is interesting characters in volatile situations. Right, right, and, and I think along with that, it, it's it, you know part of the character creation is setting up some key NPCs, and yes, uh, you know yeah. that 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 adds so much to it because right then you you as the GM can kind of take those NPCs and those get kind of woven into the fabric uh, in all sorts of, of interesting ways. I think that one thing that Powered by the Apocalypse brought back and uh, to gaming, uh, especially in the early Powered by the Apocalypse games, that the story games Forge movement had been losing for a long time is a sense of a larger world that exists outside the exist outside the PCs that the PCs have to negotiate with. Mm -hmm. There was frequently in some of those Forge era games so much power and agency in what PCs did that there was no sense that we should even have in PCs. Like are that like we're so focused on these five main characters that. Uh, you know, who cares about all their other relationships? And the, so I think there was a little bit of a loss in that. And that certainly is not something that's actually in Apocalypse World. Apocalypse World mm -hmm. frequently generates really interesting NPCs that you have to relate to and that exist, exist objectively once there, there's a little bit of sense of like, before they're on screen, we're not quite sure what they're doing, but once they're on screen, you have to cope with them. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like out of that movement, certainly Lucian Khan's Visigoths versus Malgoths really brought back that sense of a real world that exists that characters are coping with like lucian has a very story game structure for that game but the details in the mall exist as objectively and as powerfully as as a uh, the world in the keep on the borderlands or caverns of thracia or something like that i mean that mall is a mega dungeon where there's no fights but there's certainly a lot of emotions um and they are all just utterly i don't know if you guys have gotten a chance to play that game i am i I am utterly in love with these teenagers who are completely incapable of being vaguely cool at all. <laughs> like they're just they're trying desperately to be cool and they're so utterly incapable of doing it. Um, they're so hapless. Uh, and it is just such a, but it's, I think one of the beautiful things Lucian did on the back end was just make them all an objective thing. There's no like, there's, there's certainly a little bit of like asking people, so what do you really love about this store? Or like things like that. But there's not like, can I make up? No, the whole mall is laid out. You have, you have the mall, you have the plan of the mall. Uh, so there's, a, there's an objective world that exists. And I think that uh, Beyond the Wall did a nice thing of kind of hitting between where there is an objective world that exists, but you sort of make it up collaboratively before. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can kind of flesh it out in detail as you go. But there's, there's, but uh, I think that adds to the volatileness of the situation is that there are people you care about. Uh, there's more NPCs than you can use in a scenario uh, in Beyond the Wall, largely because there's a lot of mystery in them. And it's really hard to pull off mystery if there's not a lineup of, of potential suspects, uh, of potential people who could be doing things wrong. Uh, then it's not really a mystery if there's only one villainous NPC. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's only one potential bad person, it's not really a mystery who did the thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that's really something beyond the wall brought back. So 